Hey, Mike Holmes here in studio. Welcome to the Reach Keep podcast. Good to have you on board. I've got a real special interview here with you with a pastor uh, in the area. His name is Eric Ross. He is from Hayden, Colorado, and uh, you're going to really enjoy this. He has taken a church that was on life support, almost, almost closed, uh, just down to a few people, some elderly folks, and and just really kind of struggling. And he has turn this thing around. And if you are interested in turn arounding, turn arounding, there you go, or resurrecting or revitalizing a church, you need to follow along. There's some great advice here. So thanks for being with us here. And let's just jump right into this interview. He's a pastor there at Central Baptist in Hayden, Colorado, kind of Northwest Colorado, Moffat County. Are you actually in, are you in Route County, the church? Yeah, we're in Route County. Route, but then Craig, which where you work, is in Moffat right there. So mm -hmm. about 17, 18 miles away. Yeah. So anyway, it's good good to have you, Eric. And I appreciate all you've done. You have been there approximately almost exactly one year now to this day. And uh on our podcast with a lot of people who follow this and are looking for practical stuff. I mean, just practical I, most people follow me they they got the right bible they got the right music they know the local church is the hope of the world they're ready to go but sometimes they need ideas you know they need some you know some motivation from ideas and so um when you got there and things started just getting better quickly faster that was really exciting to me. It's like, I'm going to interview this guy someday. <laughs> so, <laughs> anyway, why don't you tell us, uh, and again, for those that missed it, it's Eric Ross and his wife is April, and they're in Hayden, Colorado. Why don't you give me, you know, your story, kind of the from Tucson and how, how you got here and some of that, and then I've got just some practical questions for you, how things are going there. So take All right. Yeah, well, we started, uh, my wife and I have been in the ministry for a little over 30 years now, but the last uh, 11 years we spent in Tucson, Arizona, a little town called Marana on the outskirts of Tucson, and we took a church there that uh, was a church plant that was meeting in a Spanish-speaking Seventh-day Adventist church, and the former pastor had it set up, so they meet on Saturdays, of course, so we, they would use the building on Sundays and Thursday nights, and so we moved our family out. Uh, I grew up in Tucson, so I had some history there, but we moved our family out. The guy said, there should be about 30 people. I said, man, that's a great, that'd be a great start for church to have 30 people to start out with. And our first Sunday, there was 15 and five of them was my immediate family. And then another two was my mom and dad. So uh, we ended up just having, you know, about 12 people or so to start with there. And, uh, we uh, just kind of rolled up our sleeves and just started knocking doors and making visits and inviting people out. And, and, uh, the church did pretty good. We, uh, I'll never forget, you know, first time we had 30, I thought we was breaking major records, you know, and then, uh, we got to where I think one Sunday we had 50, uh, one Sunday we had 122, oh. uh, but we had a dog and pony show with an actual dog and pony at the church. <laughs> but, uh, we got to where we was averaging pretty close to 50 in Marana. And the Spanish, the, the Seventh-day Adventist Church got in a new pastor. I called him a big city pastor. And he didn't like the idea of somebody else uh, using their building. So he gave us two months uh, to move the church. And we just finished knocking a neighborhood of a thousand doors. And uh, just, you know, that's a thousand invites out there and a thousand, you know, all the people we talked to. And we found it took, takes like two months to get any fruit from something like that. And so those two months was November and December. So we had to work around Thanksgiving and Christmas and New Year's to try to find a building. I think we had two weeks left and we found a private school who's the principal of the school. Her dad used to be a church planner. So she kind of had a soft spot for us. And uh, she let us use their brand new state of the art school building, a room in there uh, for free, which was a blessing. But we had to move the church 11 miles south from Marana. It was basically starting all over again, a whole new area, working in a whole new neighborhoods. Wow. And we were there about two years. And we, it took us about that long to kind of reestablish in another neighborhood. We started picking back up again. And uh, they got a new director of their schools in. It was a private school that had several academies around town. And uh, they were kind of a Christian school in disguise, I guess. But uh, they were wanting to start a high school. And so the, there's a huge mega church in Tucson called Victory. At the time, it was called Victory. 
And they made the school a deal, said, hey, we'll let you use our main campus to start your uh, high school in. If you'll let us use your churches, your schools around town to start satellite churches in. And so I kind of joked around that we got swallowed up in victory and uh, we had to move again. And so uh, we found a public school. They would let us rent uh, their cafeteria, but they were super expensive. It was anywhere from $800 to $1,000 a month just for Sunday mornings. Wow. And uh, But it was still another move about seven miles from where we were at, again, south. And we started meeting there and then the coronavirus hit after eight months and they shut down all the public schools. <laughs> so we had, so for 14 months, we had no place to meet at all. And uh, I did like a lot of pastors did. We started using Facebook for everything back then, which I know a lot of guys had to do. And amazingly, God used it and kept the church going. They kept the folks together. And we would try to meet once a month if possible at our house and just have a picnic and try to fellowship with everybody. And we finally found another private school that would open up. A lot of folks didn't want to rent to groups after that, you know. And we finally found another private school that would let us rent. It was pretty inexpensive. And we had the whole campus to ourselves. They had two campuses in town. And after the coronavirus, they couldn't hire enough teachers to staff both schools. We would have come back in person. So we had the whole campus to ourselves. But it, again, it was further away. And this is after 14 months of not having any in-person services. And uh, so we started back up and it was kind of rural, but we picked up, you know, and uh, started rolling again. And we were getting close to getting close back up to 30 again. And then they put the school up for sale. And I said, Lord, I'll, I'll do it every I'll do whatever you want me to do. And uh, Lord, if you want us to get a bus and put the church name on the side and we'll just say on Facebook, we'll meet at this Walmart parking lot on this Sunday and. I said, we'll name ourselves U-Haul Baptist Church. Lord, I'll do whatever you want us to do. And, oh, and we knew about Hayden about two years before we came here. And I thought, no, that's just me looking for an easy way out. You know, I, you know, we've been, you know, and for those 11 years, you know, we tore down and set up every Sunday. We loaded every, the pulpit, the chairs, everything into the van. And I know a lot of guys do it. And We'd go Saturday night and set it all up to be ready for Sunday. Then we'd tear it all down after the service. And and so I, when I when I heard about Hayden, like I said, two years ago, I thought, no, I'm just trying to look for an easier way out or, you know, and uh, and the Lord convicted me. And so I so I thought, no, I'm not going to I'm not going to contact him. And then I, then I saw they had a pastor and I thought, oh, good. And then I saw they didn't have a pastor. And I said, oh, man. And so my wife and I, we had just bought our first ever house. We've been married almost 30 years at that time and never owned our own home. So we just bought a new house and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, but the Lord, I kind of got challenged in the fact that in Northwest Tucson, there was eight good Bible believing Baptist churches within eight miles or with, yeah, within a maximum of eight miles of all of our church folks. And the truth is there was five or six that were within two or three miles of our church folks. So I kind of got convicted, you know, if our church, closed its doors today our folks would be okay there, there, there'd be a place to go close by with good pastors good churches i said but if the church in hayden closed that's it and at that time you know the, the two cities close by didn't really have pastors either and so i thought boy if this church goes down and the other ones goes down there goes the light the gospel out in that whole stretch of i-40 through colorado and and so my wife and i we were sitting on a couch and i said well do you think I should contact them? And she said, I don't know. I said, I don't know either. I said, I guess we'll just call them and talk and go from there. And uh, we didn't have any problems at our church in Tucson. We loved our folks. They loved us. We, they hung in there through every move and, you know, for all those 11 years. And and some of that before that for the, from the pre previous pastor. And uh, so we contacted them and, and come up to meet them. My wife and I got to talking about it. And I said, you know, I feel like God has spent a lifetime equipping us for min small rural ministries like this. My wife grew up in a town that had a population of 250 people mm. in Southern Ohio. And so she added up all the surrounding towns to Torch, Ohio. And it took the five little towns around Torch to equal the population of Hayden. So Hayden was kind of a big city compared to where she grew up. <laughs> so I said, you know, I said, I feel like, uh, you know, a lot of a lot of fellows don't like rural ministries because, you know, you're probably not going to make a big name in a small town or 
you know, you can't do a big work. I guess a lot of times they might think, and we just felt like we don't mind a small town. We don't, we're not trying to make a name for ourselves. We're trying to do the work of the Lord. And, mm -hmm. and we just felt like that when we came up, met the folks here, you know, there was four people, four amazing people left, you know, Pat and Dutch and uh, Connie and Daryl, and, and they were, you know, working, struggling to keep the doors open. And, and my wife and I met him. I just felt like, you know, I feel like God can use us here. Mm -hmm. I said, uh, you know, we uh, grew the stuff that we've learned growing up and the stuff we've been taught. God has equipped us to be able to serve in a place like this. And we prayed and sought the Lord's will and and we felt like God wanted us to do it. And uh, so Connie and Daryl wanted to know, well, how fast are you guys going to come up? I said, well, I said, we're not going to just leave our church folks in Tucson hanging. So we're going to make sure we get them into a good church before we leave. So we got to sell our house and I don't know how long that's going to take. And and we've got to quit our jobs and train our replacements because we we're working, uh, you know, secular jobs also. And and the Lord just took care of all of it. On our last Sunday there, our church folks, it was, it was a sad, weepy day. Let me tell you, we're all crying. And But they had already figured out that God was in it. And they'd already figured out some churches to go to. And they're all still in church. You met Brother Moxon, where a lot of our folks went there. And, and uh, we put our house for sale on a Friday evening. And it was sold by Saturday morning. <laughs> so... So I said, well, I think the Lord is moving us to Colorado. So, uh, so we came up like, you know, a year ago and not, you know, not really sure what to expect. Just knowing that my only expectation was to do the work of the ministry and, uh, and leave the rest up to the Lord. So that's kind of how we ended up here in, uh, in Hayden, Colorado of all places. So. <laughs> that, and that's an amazing, it's such an unusual story and kind of ties in with COVID and all the moving thing and, yeah, and I, I was in a church, I was speaking out in, I think, Lincoln, Nebraska, and this guy mentioned he was from Tucson. I said, oh, I got a friend from Tucson that just left, and he goes, he says, I'm the church that got his people. No. <laughs> he was like, he said, I don't think he'd met you at the time, but he's like, I don't know the guy, but, but his people are great, you know. <laughs> <laughs> they were great. They're great merger. folks. Was, you know, sometimes you have a church merger. It wasn't even a merger. Just like, you know, just gave everybody. <laughs> gave them all. Yeah. Gave them all the <laughs> that's great. That is wonderful. Well, I appreciate that. I think that's a great story. And for those of you that are listening in on this podcast or watching this on YouTube, this is a kind of story that when God gets involved, and it's it just a wonderful, wonderful thing. And as an observer from you know, 100 miles away, basically, and a little more than that, but, um, and, and someone who concerned, my wife taught at the Christian school, it was at his church originally, and I have preached at the church dozens of times, and run youth activities, and all sorts of stuff at that church, you get burdened for the church, and just to see how God can come in and do that is a great thing, so, and I know there are people watching this that are in churches that don't have a pastor, or the pastor just left or whatever. And I just let you know, God loves your church. In fact, he, he loves your church. Amen. And you and I love the church. He gave his son for it. We just give <laughs> Sunday after Sundays and Wednesdays. And, you know, we, we give time and hours and talent and treasure, but, but he gave his only begotten son. And uh, that's just a great thing to, uh, to know. Now, when you got there, um, things were, uh, the, to be honest, and like I said, great people, and know the four that were there very well. Uh, known them for really, I've known those people as long as I've known my wife. I mean, I was in their church serving back in the early 80s. Amen. All in that <laughs> church. And so, yeah, I've known them uh, good people, but because of age and health issues, I mean, your place was kind of in a, a fair amount of disrepair, you know. And you jumped right in and started doing stuff. Just what were a few of the things that you had to do? And then why did you, why did you, and obviously you worked on the spiritual side of it and prayed for things and all that, but, but you jumped right into the physical side. Tell us a little bit about some of that. Yeah. So we came in and, uh, it was, we looked around, there's a lot of stuff and it's no one's fault here. It's just, you know, they were doing everything they could to keep the doors open and things just kind of you know, kind of piled up around the place and stuff that needed fixed and repaired. And, you know, growing up, uh, you know, I don't have really any training in any of this kind of stuff other than I had a dad who's, who believed in not paying people to do the work and he did it ourselves. So, <laughs> so we, 
you know, we'd build our own house in Texas and add it on to our house in Arizona when we were teenagers, you know, doing all the work with my dad. And, and, uh, so my, my first thought was, you know, we're going to, we're going to start knocking every door in this place and we're going to start meeting people and inviting them out. And, uh, I kind of look at, kind of looked at it as if I'm a first time visitor walking into this building and I'm looking for a church and I look around and, and if I see all this stuff piled up, it's going to, Am I going to want to go there? You know, so when I walk in, does it look like a place that's ready to serve the Lord where I want to raise my family or my kids? And so we, one of the first things we wanted to do was get, you know, they'd had a flood in the basement several years ago and they'd started repairing it and then it flooded again. And, and so it just kind of got piled up down there. And I thought, you know, if we want to invite families, we want to make sure this place looks ready to go. So our, my first goal was to, get the basement where all the Sunday school classes and the fellowship hall is, get them cleaned up so they look like you could walk in and have class today, even though at that time we didn't have any classes. And so we just started with cleaning and getting rid of stuff. Now, now I don't recommend barging into somebody's church who's fought so hard to keep it open and just start pitching stuff without getting permission and talking to folks and making sure it's, you know, you just don't want to go in there and, you know, like a tornado, you want to make sure it's okay. But we went in and cleaned up and and the Lord was good because it needed a lot of drywall work upstairs, downstairs. I can do drywall work, but I'm not very good at it. And the, the uh, first family we won to the Lord, uh, that's what they did. That's what he did for a living was drywall. And I thought, thank you, Lord. And uh, he helped me get all the drywall patched up and uh, back into shape. And uh, uh, so we started by getting the building cleaned up and make sure it was ready to go and organized and and uh god was good because the parsonage that was next door has needed a roof i think for about 20 years mm -hmm. at least i saw some pictures when they put the new roof on the church building and you could see the roof of the parsonage and it was already missing shingles back in 2008 or so and but the truth is we really didn't have enough money to do it and they tried to do it several years ago and i don't know what issues came on but as I started calling roofing companies, get bids, they they all said, because there's not that many roofing companies in this part of Colorado. And they all said, well, I think we did bids there before. I know you did bids. Didn't this? I don't know what happened. But we, yes, could you just come and give us a bid, please? And uh, we had bids from 18000 just to put shingles over the shingles, all the way up to 58000 to put a metal roof on there. And and uh, I sat down and I thought, Lord, this this roof has been like their thorn in the flesh, trying to get this roof on. And uh, so we, I sat down and got all these different bids. And if we took the bid in the middle, if we took every cash, all the cash out of every single account that the church had, we could barely afford the middle bid. And uh, and so uh, I was already watching videos on how to do roofing myself. I was going to, if I said, if I have to, I'll get up there and do it myself. But I told our church folks, I said, you know, the Bible, God says that he's able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. And, uh, and I thought to myself, Lord, that means you can, you know, we're thinking, help us raise the money to put the roof on, but God, you could supply the roof. And so I told our church folks, let's start praying that God would supply. And about two weeks later, we had a fellow that I asked to come give a bid on, on putting the roof on a Christian fellow that I found through Facebook. And, uh, he came and uh, measured and, and I told us, we really like to do metal so that nobody has to worry about this for a while. And, uh, and so he came and measured and, uh, it was fun to watch at our kitchen table. We had his family there. He says, you know, I could probably get this at cost. And they bowed his head and said, no, he says, I want to supply all the metal and labor. If you guys will get the permit, and the dumpster, I'll take care of everything else. And so God, God took care of all that. He supplied everything, uh, for the roof. And, and I'm glad I didn't try to do it myself. It turned out to be three layers of roofing up there on that roof and we had more time removing nails than we did put the new roof on so and those were the guys from Platt valley baptist over there that's right from uh, shannon monday's, monday's church. church yeah yeah they did a, they were awesome they did a great job yeah. yeah it was pretty exciting that sunday that we could look out the window and see the new roof we were baptizing for the first time in 17 years about so it was pretty exciting just a pretty exciting sunday wow that is and you know Again, for our, our listeners and some of that, it, you you said something. I wrote it down here. You wanted to, or you took on the eyes of a first-time visitor. 
Right. That is super important for the pastor, other leaders in the church to pretend like they're a first time visitor and go, why is that stuff piled there? Why is that, why is that roof all messed up? Why is that drywall, you know, all tore up and whatever. And that is a powerful, powerful thing. And I, I really admire you. So when we're, again, we're talking about putting a roof on and all that. It's like, that doesn't sometimes seem like the work of the ministry, the preaching and the praying and the, you know, loving on people and some of that stuff, but it's extremely important. So it is. Yeah. Let me ask you this question here because this is sort of the, the balance here and, and I call it like the, it's sort of what I call Sunday prep versus sermon prep. In other words, you got to obviously get ready for a sermon and those things come, you know, every week, you know, we've got church. It just keeps coming and coming and coming. But then you have what I call Sunday prep. And Sunday prep is like the, the you know, it's got to be vacuumed and it's got to be clean. Right. <laughs> In your case, brand new for you, the, the snow has to be shoveled. <laughs> That's right. That's <laughs> right. Has to be plowed. Yeah. Uh, that, that type of thing. For those of you that are, know this, we're recording this the last day of May. I'm sure you probably had frost the last couple nights. We did. Our my bird bath was frozen. You know, I told someone <laughs> that the other day. In fact, someone in Phoenix I talked to them was like 100 degrees today. He said, uh, "Well, my bird bath was frozen this morning." You know, <laughs> but yeah, you you have to shovel snow. You know, nine months out of the year, and you got to do that's Sunday prep, and then there's sermon prep. Can you speak to kind of how you mentally kind of balance that? Because you've obviously heard you preach you do a great job you're on facebook you get all that stuff out there and how are you what's the what's the ratio there because i mean sometimes there's an awful lot of sunday prep needs to happen there is especially when you're bivocational and uh oh. so i've gotten to the point that the age i am now i don't worry about uh, time management and i worry about energy management <laughs> so so i know that uh you know coming up to sunday and and you know, I know a lot of times a lot of guys think that the ministry is praying and preaching and sermon prep and uh, all those kind of things. And uh, the truth of the matter is the ministry is is all of those kind of things. Hello, Miss Pat. Hold on just a minute there, brother. Hey, Miss Pat. I, uh, yeah, you can grab those things. No problem. The front door's unlocked, too. Hello. You want to say hi to Brother Mike Holmes? <laughs> <laughs> we're we're doing a little video class. And so I'll turn you around there. So hi, <laughs> good to see you. Yeah. I'm there. <laughs> I couldn't answer you because I was on the phone. So I was like, oh, I see you're out there. But the front door's unlocked too. So. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, I walked around because I thought maybe I heard the weed eating. No, oh, okay. Just look nice. I'm trying to look professional and smart. <laughs> okay. See you later. <laughs> Thank you. So, Hell Dutch, I said hello. I'll drive around there. Okay. There's the okay. All right. That's what local church is all about, right there. That's right. <laughs> so, but that's the. That's the important things that need to happen and not just it is. your sermon. Yeah, you can carry on on that again. So, you know, if you pay attention to the Bible, you know, when they were building the temple, you know, that's still the work of the ministry. You know, when they were restoring the wall and when they were rebuilding the temple and they're fighting, those are all still works of the ministry. So a lot of times people get the idea, oh, pastoring is, uh, you know, it's just you go and you preach and you pray and you make some visits and. No ministry is anything that needs to be done that, you know, that, that you're able to do. And for the truth is my wife and I, we just enjoy whatever we can do for the Lord. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't, I don't enjoy cleaning the bathrooms at the County courthouse, but I, I love cleaning them here at the church. You know, there's a difference between the work, you know? And so, but so for us, uh, you know, I always heard this saying, you know, you see the, see the need and take the lead. Right. So I thought if that's something I can do, I don't mind jumping in and doing it. And, uh, and uh, but we want to we want to make sure that uh, the church is ready for Sunday. You know, and it's more than just, yes, I want to have a, you know, I want to have a sermon that's not boring. I want to have a sermon that has some practical application to it. But I also want to make sure the bathrooms are ready for anybody that needs to use it. And, you know, we're working on the basement. And so the one 
room off to my corner here that used to be part of the Christian school. We finished the drywall. We've got it set up as kind of the fellowship hall, but we also have it set up as a nursery for when, just in case we need a nursery. And so this past Sunday, we had, had needed a nursery. So my wife already had a lesson ready. And so we already had the nursery set. It's nothing fancy, but we, we want to make sure stuff is ready. So before we had all that done, we made up little baggies with a little coloring book and a little toy and a little snack in there. So if the, so if the families came in, we didn't, you know, the classrooms were full of stuff when we first got here. And so we had those baggies sitting on the back. And so that way the kids could sit in the pew and they could stay busy with quiet stuff, you know, during the service to help keep them busy. So mom and dads could listen and, but, you know, you want to have a view that says being ready for Sunday is more than just the preaching. It's, you know, do we do we have visitors cards ready? You know, is the is the grass mode is are the sidewalks clear? You know, is the room cleaner? The bat does the bathroom smell clean? You know, the, you know, uh, you want to make sure that we take a few moments and and talk to everybody that comes in and make them feel welcome and, and let them know we're glad that they're we're, they're here and. And, uh, and so there's a whole lot that goes into making a Sunday, you know, we want Sundays to be joyful. You know, we want folks to come here and say, I'm glad that I came, <laughs> right? So, and that's a place I want to go back to. And so, you know, I've, I've never understood the idea that, oh, I'm the pastor, uh, that stuff's beneath me. And that shouldn't be true because Jesus washed the disciples' feet. He set us the ultimate example of a servant, especially when he gave his life on the cross. And so I'm thinking if, if Jesus can give his life on the cross for my sins, surely I can clean a bathroom for him or, or vacuum a hallway or wipe down a window. And, and uh, it's all about serving, serving him in any way that I can. So Amen. that's the best way I know how to explain it. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. I like that. See the need, take the lead. So, yeah, you are definitely, when, when I was there not too long ago, you guys are definitely expecting guests. You know, I mean, that's sort of that, that phrase that we try to use at Reach Keep here is every Sunday we're expecting guests. We're Amen. ready for them. And, and that creates what we call a preparation environment. And in other words, there's an environment you know that it's ready. Okay, like if you were to go to an NFL football game, you know that they'd have the grass manicured and the end zone right. all painted and everything would be, the stands would be all clean because it's a, preparation environment and I, I want to ask you this what are some of kind of the sort of maybe some of the unseen benefits to the seen and unseen of having that preparation environment what do you what do you think happens when when you have that that you know uh, kind of speak to that because you've seen some of the fruit of it I mean I've been there and I've seen Good things are going on. Tell us a little bit about the, the fruit of that, of your preparation environment that you have. Well, I think, uh, I think one benefit is you can relax and be ready for the service on Sunday because you know everything's ready to go, right? So, you know, I'll, I'll come in on a Sunday morning, I'll walk over early and I'll walk the parking lot and make sure nobody threw any bottles out in the parking lot and make sure everything's clean that way. You know, and I'll go out and make sure that, uh, you know, the heat's ready to go and the heat's on. And I think one of the benefits is you're not sitting there going, oh, man, you know, I forgot to do that. Or, man, I hope the bathrooms, you're not worried about all this other stuff. You can focus in on the people and you can focus in on the preaching because, you know, everything else is good to go. You don't have to worry about it on Sunday, you know, and so and I don't have to worry. Oh, man, they're going down to use the bathroom and I didn't clean it today or it hasn't been cleaned or or, oh, man, look at them trying to park, and there's a big chunk of blacktop that's come out of our parking lot laying out there, and they I don't want them to trip over it. And, and uh, you know, one, one of the things that I try to stress as a pastor is teaching our folks to greet people. And, uh, you know, if you probably walked into church before where everybody looks at you like, what's this person doing here that I don't know? <laughs> and so, and don't sit in my spot. And, uh and so we try to teach our folks, any, anybody that walks through that door, we got to look at them as if they walked in that door, God must have brought them here. So we need to make sure that they feel welcome. And so I said, anytime you see anybody coming in, I don't care how scary they look. I don't care how strange they may look. I don't care how bad they smell. I said, go over there and tell them, we're so glad you're here. And, that, and, and that's one way I think you prepare for Sunday as a pastor is prepare your people to 
to love the people that come in because there's nothing worse as a visitor walking in the church and you don't feel welcome by anybody there. So it starts with the pastor making them feel welcome. And then as a pastor, teach your folks to make people feel welcome too. So, so I think one of the benefits of it is when you're prepared, when the visitors come in, you know, you know, we got to stop and think because they're coming in, they're looking for a place to go to church. <laughs> so you think about you, if I'm going somewhere and I'm looking for a place to go to church and I, what, when I walk in, what would I want to see? Do I want to see a church that just gives me these weird faces, you know, because they look at me like, what are you doing invading our personal space, you know, and, and uh, what does it look like when I walk in, if I walk in for the first time? And so I think the ben one of the benefit, another benefit is your guests notice it. And I like what I, I heard a preacher say one time, we need to call them guests and not visitors. Amen. And and uh, he said, you know, a visitor is somebody that's just there to leave. A guest is somebody you want to stick around for a while. And so we need to have like a guest philosophy. So, you know, if we see a family come in, I, I do this with every family that comes in. If they got some kids, I'll go talk to the kids. And uh, because nowadays kids have a huge influence over where they where the parents go to church. So I'll go in and if it's teenagers, I'll talk to them and find out what grade they're in, find out what they're interested in and talk to them about that. And if they're little kids, I'll just ask them who their favorite superhero is, <laughs> but just get to know them and talk to the, talk to the families. And, but just make that, you know, and I think one of the benefits of that is like, you know what those, you know, if you go to a church and you leave there go, man, those folks were nice. It's going to make it more likely that they're going to want to come back. Mm. And so, you know, we need to reflect Christ's love to everybody that walks in the door. Amen. And uh, and no, they may not be dressed right. They may not act right or may not have this or that. But the truth is, Jesus took us when we were like that and loved us <laughs> and gave us the grace and patience and the long suffering to grow in Christ. And no one's ever going to come to church and grow if we run them off the first Sunday. <laughs> so, so we want to make sure we love them and make them feel welcome. And I think that's one of the benefits. If you do that then the folks are more likely to want to come back the next time and try it out. So. Amen. That's good. Yeah. We, we do a shorter version of uh, some of this podcast called the better Sundays podcast. And it's usually only 10 minutes long and uh, it's kind of found on YouTube here as well, but we summarize some of these, these different things like this. So we're probably going to take some of these and kind of put them in there. We've already got some of the notes written for it and, I was talking to someone else the other day about the preparation environment and just all these things that like, if this is the, if this is the environment, it makes people proud of their church. It makes people, right. you know, like, Hey, there's a leader here. It makes people like want to volunteer here. It, like People want to get behind you. They want to give, they want to, you know, get, they want to tell, they want to tell people, you know, those are all really, really cool things. So you're uh you obviously have vision, okay, and and you know for some of this, and I, you know, you had some of your annual plans out there, but talk a little bit about how pastors can, and, and the importance of them, and maybe not necessarily get into the specifics of your little valley there, you know, but in general, how can pastors be better at you know, and, and why do they need to have vision and let that vision flow to the people? What's, how's that work for you? Well, I think especially in a small and a rural church, you know, we don't have a lot of big fancy stuff to uh, offer people. And it gets really easy just to get stuck in the routine. If we show up for church, we do what we're supposed to do and we go home. And we forget that, and, and I explain this all the time, the work here in Hayden, even though the population is only 2,000, is no less important than the work that goes on in New York City, right? Mm -hmm. It's yeah. still souls that need to be saved. And so it's easy for, for a small church to get in this feeling of we're, we don't really, we're not, we're kind of insignificant. We're just here so we can have church. And, and it's important that I think the church realizes they're part of a mission, of Christ's mission, even though it's just a small town. And uh, so one of the ways you want to cast that vision is, is make people realize there's a, an important job that we're here for. We're not just here to occupy this corner. You know, we're not just here to maintain a building. Uh, we're here because of the Great Commission. This, uh, and so part of casting vision is understanding why, why is this church here? And, uh, uh, and that doesn't matter where, no matter where your church is in. You know, you may only have 
my wife's hometown, the population of the, their hometown was only 250. Uh, but uh, the truth is there's that's 250 souls that Christ loves and that he died for. Mm -hmm. And so part of it, I think in order to have vision, you have to realize your purpose. Why is our church here? You know, it's not here just to, it's not a country club. It's just not a community meeting place. There's a purpose why it's here. You know, you know, I look at this building and I think to myself, uh, you know, why is this building here? It's a beautiful building. It's a nice building. Yeah. And, and, and all this building costs something and God supplied it all. So why did God supply for our building to be on our corner or in our neighborhood, wherever your town is? Well, he put it there because he wants it to be a light to get the gospel to that town and uh, in that area. And so part of vision is realizing, I think, why are we here? What are we here for? You know, I'm not here for a job. You know, I'm not here for a salary. We're here because Christ wants us to get the, reach the this area with the with the gospel of Jesus Christ, and so that has to be our our main thing. And so, I think if you under if you really understand how important that is, then it helps give you some vision for what it is you're wanting to do. And so, right. and uh, then I think the second part of vision is, you know, and I think this becomes stronger the older that I get, is that. Uh, I don't want to just leave a legacy of me. I want it to be that when I pass away or if I move on, the church is strong and the mission continues. So vision has to extend beyond my tenure here. It has to go on to, all right, when we leave, we want the gospel to still be being spread uh, in our community. We want, the, we want the work of Christ to continue. And so I think you have vision when you realize why we're here and you have vision when you have an eternal view. That says this isn't just about, you know, me making a name for myself. And I always joke around and say we went from four to eighteen, so that's, you know, a three hundred percent increase. And the sword Lord hasn't called me yet to speak, you know. And so yeah. we have the, but we it's but we have to realize it's not about it's not about us. It's about we Christ has us here for a purpose. So vision says I want to fulfill that purpose, and then vision also says I want it to be that we win people to Christ here. That when I'm gone, they continue the work of Christ here, and it keeps going until the day Jesus Christ comes back. And uh, and so vision, so we, so part of vision is, you know, casting vision to people is letting them understand the purpose. This is why we're here. And then part of vision is casting vision is the why we're doing this. You know, why are we putting so much work in cleaning up everything? Well, yeah. because is is I spent hours down there sanding, wonderful hours of sanding drywall, one of my favorite things in the world to do, especially in those little rooms. As I'm sanding, I'm praying and saying, Lord, fill this classroom one with kids being taught the word of God, but also give us, we need teachers too. We're going to need people to teach these classes. So Lord, so as I'm sanding, I'm thinking, I'm picturing what I want this what this room needs to be used for. We want to see the Bible being taught here, kids being saved. We want to see people that we've won to Lord who are now teaching God's word in these classes. And so vision, that's to me, that's what keeps me going. You know, so if if my if my vision is based on my salary or uh the the attendance of the church or those kind of things, I'm gonna get disappointed pretty quick. But if my joy comes from what God can do through it and doing the work that God has me to do, it helps the vision to be a lot greater, I guess, and stronger. So, hmm. but so I guess vision's got to go beyond self. It's got to go beyond personal goals. It needs to go, be, our vision needs to be based upon the work of God. And we realize that that work's never going to end. And so, uh, and I want to make sure that, you know, someday we're going to stand before the Lord <laughs> Yep. And my, I'm not worried about the mansion. I'm not worried about the streets of gold. I just want to hear Jesus say, well done. Well done. <laughs> so, and so I guess that's, that's been a big drive for me is I want to, when I see, I think when we see him and the full comprehension of his sacrifice and his love for us hits us, mm -hmm. we're going to wish we'd have done more. And, uh, and we're going to realize how important what it was that we did on earth that time that we spent on earth how important it was and so i think part of vision is realizing that eternal view keeping that eternal view in place that's good you talked about being driven by that let me ask you kind of in your past and this would be not necessarily a 
scriptural answer, but more maybe some examples. What is it, or who was it maybe that that puts some of this into you? Who who shaped you, or who is is there something you know something that really stuck out that kind of made you be this way? Because this is unique. I mean, I'm I'm excited about it. But when I I got saved in uh, Yellowstone National Park, I was up there working for the summer. I was 20 years old, had no church background, just went a few times as a kid. Hmm. And uh, so when I got back to Tucson, all I knew was, is that I had asked Jesus to be my savior. I didn't know that it meant I was saved. I just knew that I'd asked Jesus to save me and I was going to heaven someday. And I was starting to read my Bible and I realized in the Bible, you know, people got baptized after they got saved. I was reading the Bible and realized they went to church and so I finally ended up in an independent Baptist church and that pastor is the one that God used to, you know, he taught me about soul winning. He taught me about using the right Bible. He taught me about, you know, the work. And that's where I was called to preach. I was actually called to preach under Tom Williams. Really? Wow. And uh, I was going to school to be a physical therapist. <laughs> so I was going to be a physical therapy tech. I was already in school for that. But before I started, I knew that God was, calling me to preach but I didn't want to do it and uh but I went to hear Tom Williams preach and uh and uh really liked brother Williams there in Tucson Arizona and so I talked my mom and dad into coming to hear this cowboy preacher and so first time I ever got my mom and dad to come to church and uh brother Williams was there giving an invitation and about surrendering to the ministry and boy the Lord was really really convicted me and I didn't want to do it. So I told the Lord, I said, I'll make you a deal, God. If my dad will go forward and get saved, I'll surrender to preach right now. And I felt like the Lord said, it doesn't work that way. <laughs> so, but as I'm sitting there fighting the Lord, I hear Tom Williams go, there's a young man here today that God is calling to preach. <laughs> and I was like, oh man, it was the worst invitation I've ever been in my lifetime. I didn't go forward, but it was that moment on, I couldn't shake it. And uh, so Tom Williams was a big influence. Uh, in the beginning to surrender to preach and then my my uh, first pastor uh, God really used him and uh, but I think a lot of my over the years there's been a lot of different pastors and preaching I think that has shaped and challenged my heart mm. and uh, you know I'm a I'm a Bible college dropout so if somebody's looking for somebody intelligent they're they're looking in the wrong place you know I joked around with April I said I'm going to tell everybody they need to start every morning with a sausage and cheese biscuit and that's that's my secret. But uh, <laughs> yeah, I think over the years, watching and learning, I uh, I would watch how some pastors, when they get somebody who was willing to work, worked them into the ground, and uh, you know, or I'd watch where pastors were real good at the professional side of ministry, but they weren't good at the people side of ministry. And so I think watching a lot of watching a lot of this. Uh, growing up, I was a principal of a Christian school for a little while, and there's several different independent Baptist churches were involved, and I'd watch, you know, how the teenagers were, you know, lots, a lot of stuff I learned just from watching and observing, but there were a lot of pastors and preachers that, uh, Paul Chapel is one, he ha used to have way back when a, uh, a little ministry where he'd send you a, a three-ring binder and some CDs, and you could listen to some lessons on pastoral ministry, and yeah. And he taught me a lot about the right philosophy for ministry. And, uh, and I have to actually, I actually have to credit uh, a couple of Southern Baptist guys that, that God used to really convict me to get up here. Mm. Uh, they have a, a podcast called Revitalize and Replant. And, uh, mm. and just about the time I'm trying to pray about this, I just happen to, I'm always trying to listen to a podcast or something. I'm trying to grow myself in ministry so reading books and listening to podcasts and so there's been a lot of pastors that have influenced my thinking over the years to mm -hmm. to help me you know understand those kind of things so mm -hmm. and uh so uh a lot of a lot of different things so i'd encourage always be looking to grow you know never feel like you've arrived in ministry I, the older i get the, re the more dumb i realize that i am <laughs> so and so i try to get any any it's amazing i can listen to a whole sermon but one little nugget in that pastoral lesson yeah just hits me and so matter of fact the idea for the baggies i got from the southern baptist guys podcast that i listened to for small churches so. uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. yeah hey they work yeah we have something similar yeah very good let me ask you 
uh, one last question here, and then I'll let you kind of give some of your contact information. Um, we talked, we joke about being kind of secluded out here in the West and off, you know, uh, far away from everything. Um, I notice that when you're serving, many times you're often alone, you know, and you're doing it by yourself. And it's great that you had the guy get saved at the, the drywall. And we all try to get volunteers as much as possible. But plugging on by yourself alone, can you just speak to that? What kind of keeps, uh, what makes that happen? And what are your feelings? And and how can we encourage guys that are out there? Because a lot of people listen to this are in a small church and they're by themselves and they just need some encouragement. Yeah, one thing I learned years ago from Paul Chapel actually was when I first started out in ministry, I thought I was going to be the next Jack Hiles and build the largest growing, fastest growing church in America. And after about five years, <laughs> when I first started out, I, I hadn't even come close to that. You know, most people had Sunday school classes bigger than my church. And I got pretty discouraged because I had all these expectations of, you know, having the largest growing, fastest growing church in town. And you know, we were going to reach thousands. We were going to start missions. I mean, I had all these big. And when that didn't come to fruition, I felt like I was a failure, just to be honest with you. You know, yeah. I was like, I'm doing all this and I'm, I'm not getting anywhere. So and I see what those guys are doing. So I must I must, you know, I must not be any good. You know what I'm doing. So God must not be using me or blessing me. And I realized it took me a while and that really knocked me for a loop for a while. And uh, I was almost ready to give up on pastoring in my 20s. And then I realized I need to make my expectation and my joy come from doing the work of the ministry. Mm. And so, you know, I, you go out soul winning and you knock on a hundred doors, you don't see anybody saved. You think, man, I'm no good at soul winning. But I learned my expect, my Jesus didn't tell me to go and, and make sure people get saved. He told me to just go and tell. So now I make my goals instead of seeing so many people say my goals are now. He told me to go and to tell. So my joy is going to come from the fact of knowing that I went out and I knocked a hundred. So we set door knocking goals now instead of people save goals. And uh, so we set the goal. We're going to knock a hundred doors this week. We knock a hundred doors that week. And we're going to try to get the gospel to anybody that we can. And so now I have, now I can have a greater joy because I did what he told me to do. He told me to go and preach the gospel. And that's what we did. And uh, and so I get joy from doing the work of the ministry. And I think that's kind of evolved my thinking. So here we are in this small town. And now God is bringing folks in. But, you know, a lot of times we're, at, you know, about there straightened up the big metal sign by myself or we're stripping floors by myself. But mm -hmm. I've learned to draw my joy from doing the work of the ministry. And so, and, uh, you know, I don't draw my joy from people. Uh, now I love people and, and we love our church folks and I get, I'm joyful to be around them, but I draw my joy from knowing that I've preached the word of God, that I've loved them, that I've prayed for them. And, and so one of the ways you can, I think, and especially in small towns and in small situations, you know, you go to these big conferences and they're talking about, well, Here's how you assimilate visitors. I'm like, well, we don't have a we don't have a team to assimilate visitors. I am the team, you know. And so, yeah. brother Daryl does a great job handing out the the welcome packets and collecting up things for me. Dar you know, brother Daryl's our whole welcome ministry team, you know. And so, so make so get your joy, you know, drive your joy in doing the work of the ministry. So I can be downstairs. I'm trying to repaint the mural and the nursery that got destroyed by flooding. And, and I'm just, I'm just having to just find joy in doing the work of the Lord. That's the easiest way I know how to explain it. You know, I was going to say, I saw a picture of, of your multimedia team one time. Yes, uh, that's right. <laughs> you had a picture on Facebook of your, you and your wife, I think. And it says, here's the multimedia team, you know, right. <laughs> you know, and it's like, but you guys were happy and you were doing it and you have your joy from, from serving there. That is, that's just excellent, excellent advice. So um, let me have you give all your information. And before I do, I want to recommend that people, if it's okay with you, friend you on Facebook, because you always have a post about something you're doing in your church. And you've used, used, if you're a pastor out there, 
uh, Eric has used Facebook extremely well for just, you know, getting the word out that what's going on with this church and in the community and uh, some of that. So, yeah, people need to friend you with that. And and uh, that would be great. So t tell us how uh, people can get in touch with you or, you know, pray for you and a little details about that. All right. I just want to encourage every, you know, small town, small church, rural pastor or big city pastor that's in a small church you know you're important to the lord and god's not done and don't give up don't get discouraged what you're doing he loves just as much as he loves what the the big churches are doing and just you know hang in there for the lord and, and enjoy working for him and so uh, don't let anybody tell you any different but uh so they can get a hold of me uh, i can give out my cell phone number i guess i will warn you that the town of hayden we have one bar of cell phone service when the wind's blowing right so yeah. uh, so you may have to just leave a text message or a voicemail. And finally, when I get somewhere with your signal, I'll get your message. So don't think that I'm not trying to answer your call. It's just this town is I can stand in the corner bedroom of the parsonage and get two bars if I hold the phone just right. So <laughs> but so they can call my cell phone number. That'd be fine. Yeah, it's uh, 520-345-4673. So 520-345. Three four five four six two seven. You can text that. My email address is all lowercase. It's bro b r o ross r o s s a z at gmail dot com. So bro ross a z at gmail dot com. And you're welcome to uh, email me there or find me on Facebook if you can. If I'm on there somewhere, but uh, but if you know if I can ever be in a help, I'd be glad to do it just to pray with you. Uh, you want to go get chicken strips? We can go do that. So, <laughs> and uh, try to be an encouragement. So, and it's Eric Ross with a C. Okay, mm -hmm. make sure you get that in there. And then the church you uh, when you do Facebook, do you do it under Central Baptist? Is that? Oh uh, yes, yeah, Central Baptist Church of Hayden, of Hayden, Colorado. Okay, so on mm -hmm. Facebook, people can look up Central Baptist, yeah, right, and find your sermons and contact you, message you, and some of that stuff. So. Well, this has been wonderful, brother. I really, I really appreciate you taking time for us here, and uh, we are going to get this out. And for our listeners and watchers here, if this has been helpful for you, you know, subscribe to this channel, uh, follow yeah. Eric, get in touch with me. We're here to help you with this kind of stuff. And if you're a small church and you are alone, um, you said something kind of interesting. Um, you said, you know, if you're a small church, you'll never be a big name, you know. But for those of you, Eric included, man, you're a big name with me. I mean, Maybe. these guys right. are out in these little rural places all over, or even not necessarily rural, but, you know, in a city, but small. You know, we love you and uh, we're here for you. And you, Amen. Uh, you're a big name. Yeah, you are a big name with us. And, and with the Lord, you know, serve, serve him with gladness. So, all right. Well, thanks for joining us here at uh, the Reach Keep podcast. We appreciate that very much. And God bless you. And again, uh, give us a thumbs up here if this has been important to you or give us a subscribe. And we will see you the next time that we're on here. So thank you very much. God bless. This is Mike signing out. We'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.